Okay, uh, on the note, and as a bit of a highly, let's call it a highly speculative question, because I've been thinking, if we could imagine, what would an AI model built through this toolkit you you put forward, which is the firstly the e cognition, and then also the an active inference, and then the broader free free energy principle. So, what would an AI agent or a model built with that toolkit? How would that differ? to like, let's say, using deep learning, something like a uh, chat GPT or an LLM. Wh- how can we, if you can imagine an AI agent coming from that line of thinking, or, or let's say that world, what would it look like? Excellent question. Very happy to answer that one. Um, so it would look like something quite different. So when we were talking about large language models being, um, whatever output they give you, it's an output that is not factual. It's, a, it's an output that is not intelligent. It's an output that is coming from the monolith uh, databases that it has access to. And it's not extrapolating in the future. It's not making decisions for the future, even though it looks like, again, Chinese room. It looks like it is, but it's not giving you facts. It doesn't understand what it's doing, and it's not giving you new opportunities or creative uh, um, or creative pathways towards the future. So those are the limitations that uh, large language models have. Um, and that's why they are called stochastic parrots. Yes, right? I love that term. <laughs> exactly. So that's yeah. why they're called stochastic parrots. This is, these are the, 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 the limitations that they have. And uh, even recently, the OpenAI CEO or CTO, um, in an interview, uh, quite rightly so, said, for us to make any progress from here, we need another breakthrough. Because this is it, right? This is it. Uh, of course, we can develop many, many, many apps on the basis of the large language models, and we can do lots of creative things that, and that can help us um, do our most fastidious uh, tasks, work tasks in, in different ways. And of course, it's having a profound impact in, in all levels and scales of society, including the universities, uh, so all of the places where we generate uh, knowledge, as well as in any other societal domains, um, which makes it even more important for us to understand why these systems are stochastic parrots and why we need to be careful ab- about, uh, about it. So, uh, that being said, uh, what would uh, large language models, so that we have a, a, a case that we can um, use, um, look like under an active inference uh, framework, which is something that we're actually working on. Um, so that would look like a distributed system of intelligence, right? What, what this means is that um, it's important to maybe just first, I would just um, say something about active inference and free energy principle um, is it has been developed uh, in last few years uh, to understand uh, cognition and the brain. So the ways in which coming from where I'm coming from, which is the e-cognitive science understanding of cognitive life, um, active inference as a model to understand that um, is relevant and interesting because it, um, it gives you a coupling between a system and its environment. So it gives you a situatedness, right? So where there is some level of uh, operational closure, right, by the Markov blanket that you mentioned, but the system must, if the system wants to remain alive, and typically they do, um, stressing that typically uh, there are uh, there are exceptions which are very interesting to study. Um, so if the system wants to remain alive, it has to be permanently open. In, in exchanging energy and matter with the environment. That's how it remains alive. So that is the subtlety that is quite important and relevant that, that this framework brings into the table, is that it tells you something that might look like a contradiction, which is, how is it possible that the system is both operationally closed and thermodynamically open? Right. So once you do that, that's not only uh, quite compatible with what an activist say, right? Um, and it's completely, from this perspective, would be completely rejecting the view that uh, cognition is encapsulated in the brain and the brain is separated from the environment. Therefore, it needs to infer quite literally what is happening in the environment. So from this perspective, I'm rejecting uh, computational theory of mind and saying that, well, that's not the case, actually, because you need to be uh, thermodynamically open, constantly exchanging matter and energy with the environment. 
And interestingly, I'm not talking here only on the agent level. I'm talking about all levels of life. So a cell must be situated in a cell tissue such that it is operationally closed. It's got boundaries, right? Um, and it must be uh, thermodynamically open such that it's always uh, exchanging matter and energy with its environment if it wants to remain alive, right? So that is quite uh, interesting um, and relevant. So once you understand uh, cognition like that, you understand cognition as systems that are um, permanently coupled with the environment. And when they're not, they are dead because they become closed systems, not open systems. So that is all coming from systems uh, neuroscience, and it's quite. Uh, I think it's quite a, a good uh, a good complement uh, from a technical, computationally technical perspective. It's a good complement to uh, the more uh, theoretical development that we do within e-cognitive science or in activism. So that's that. Now applying all of that knowledge that we've been working on within cognitive science to artificial intelligence, things are going to look quite different. To when you come from a computational perspective, right? Because when you come from a computational perspective, you may be happy to define uh, that a humanoid robot that is equipped with a large language model is going to be sentient, is going to be intelligent, is going to be a cognitive system. You might end up to those conclusions, right? Mm -hmm. It's easy to, to make those steps. Uh, when you come from e-cognitive science, that's, that doesn't come for free. It's not a commodity that a system that is just like behaving like is intelligent is intelligence so we will see in there a chinese room situation right um so then uh on that note uh what you would want to achieve and where you want to go in the future is you want to have uh if you we are talk talking about like any form of artificial intelligence that is anywhere in the realm of a natural intelligence system then what you want to have is we want to have a system that is capable of adapting to high levels of surprise, and here I'm already introducing the free energy principle, um, adaptable to high levels of surprise, right, that can deal with high levels of surprise, um, that can make decisions, real-time, real-world decisions, based on the understanding of the present state of affairs. And this is very different to what a large language model can do, because a large language model is going to give you what was the likelihood of certain words or certain facts or certain things coming uh, until, with, according to what I've, we've got in our databases, until a certain point in time. So it's going to give you what happened in the past. And if you really want to have a system that is anywhere close to what we are capable to do, it needs to be able to in the real world, in the present time, make decisions that are highly sensitive to the context around them, right? Um, in the ways that it understands um, the state of affairs, and that's not a large language yeah. model. Yeah. yeah, no, totally. I mean, I'm, forgive me, I'm, I'm a bit of a romantic. Just thinking about the idea that how beautiful uh, that is, because the, one other thing with the LLMs or large language models is the immense computational power it takes to run these models. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. I don't know if you're familiar with Scott Aronson, the American computer scientist. He was, he was, he is, uh, I believe he's a, he's like a, a consultant at OpenAI. He was saying recently that um, OpenAI has been investing in quantum computing because they're running out of resources to, to find, fill these uh, LLM models because they take that much energy. And with all of that, it can't even still live in the, can't exist in the present conditions. It's still living in the past. Whereas as humans, we're totally different in the sense that we don't need one one millionth of that kind of energy, but also we can live in the present world and as you laid out, you know, reduce uncertainty, uh, whatever the case may be. Um, so I, I just find that a beautiful idea of describing what it means to be a human 